So today we're going to be going over four and maybe even five if we have time, uh, five different ways to do a comparative market analysis. I'm actually going to prop my camera up here a little bit so you can see me better. So a lot of people might look at me and be like, how's this 12 year old going to teach me how to do CMAs? But I'll tell you that I've actually done over 10,000 CMAs, believe it or not. Um, it was pretty much my entire job description for several years uh, was to just do CMA after CMA for investors. Um, if you're new to the industry, CMA is comparative market analysis. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So I'm going to start with the easiest approaches because I want you to have something quick. You know, the last thing I'm going to go through is a custom CMA, and that's a little bit more tricky. It's going to take a lot of practice to be able to do a custom CMA. I would say I did at least a couple hundred of those before I even really felt like I could with confidence tell people what something was worth. But these first few methods will at least get you in the ballpark so you can go to a listing appointment and not feel like you're $300,000 off, right? Or even 50,000. It should at least get you where you need to be. But I would highly recommend what I teach during the last half of class today. Um, go back and watch the video later, do whatever you need to do and just practice it, practice it, practice it because I've never seen it. one of these other methods will be as detailed as doing a custom one by hand. So let's go ahead and jump in. Um, does anybody have any questions before we get started? Cool. Sorry, somebody unmuted themselves. All right. Well, the would there, oh, sorry. Yeah, go, go <laughs> would ahead, there Dan. ever be a, a, another reason to use a CA, CMA other than for a listing appointment? Oh, yeah, all the time. Um, it's one of the best ways to get listings. Um, probably the most underutilized tool we have for prospecting is doing a free comparative market analysis for our neighbors. Um, I mean, maybe one out of 20 or 30 of them might think you're a little weird for digging into the value of their home but it's honestly a, a very valuable thing for them to know what their home's worth. So for you to just, um, I remember my mentor, his first year in real estate, he did a CMA for every single house on his block. Mm -hmm. And he didn't even tell him he was doing it. He just did it, made it look nice, put a cover photo on it and knocked on the door and said, Hey, I wanted to give this to you guys. I, I worked on it. And um, he told them that it took a little bit of time, but he wanted to be neighborly and share his talent with people so that they can, have benefit from it. And I think he got like at least two listings and it was something that a lot of them were grateful for. So I imagine it got him more listings over time as well. So I would definitely recommend doing it for that. And then um, for investors, you might do, if you work with investors, you might do two or three CMAs a day if they're trying to flip a property or find a good rental and they want a discount you can do a CMA as a buyer's agent just to make sure you're offering for a fair amount and you're not going to waste your client's money on a bad appraisal. I've done a CMA for almost every single home I've put under contract these last couple of years because of low appraisals. I don't want to offer too high on something and then my clients spend 500 bucks on an appraisal and it doesn't appraise. So lots of reasons. I have a question, Brian. When you do it for like your neighbors, um, what if, I mean, what if you haven't been into their house and their home is, and the homes in the area are a custom built where every home is different? Um, so the comparables are really, really tricky unless you've been in the home and see exactly. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's actually a great opportunity for a further conversation. Because I always give a range anyway. I, I would never, even in a listing appointment, I would never sit down with somebody and say, hey, your home is worth $350,000 or that's what it will sell for. I always say, here's the low end, here's the high end, here's the mid middle. But if you're going to a neighbor's house, uh, not to digress too much, but you'd say, hey, you know, I did this. I haven't been in your house. If you would like, I can do a more detailed one now that I've kind of seen the inside a little bit but I thought this was at least good enough since you guys aren't selling, it will give you an idea of what your home's worth. And then you just show them how to read the CMA. Like they'll see, oh, these ones are on the low end, these are on the high end, ours is nicer than those. So they'll, they'll be able to utilize the tool just fine. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So let's just jump in. I'm gonna share my screen here. 
and I will show you uh, what I call the poor man CMA, and that's the cloud CMA. It's actually a pretty neat tool if you're a new agent or if you've done less than five or 600 CMAs, I would say always at least cross-reference your work with this because it does pull valuable data that can be helpful. So with the cloud CMA, you click on it. And if you've never set up an account, it might make you create a password. I can't remember, but it does redirect you to mm -hmm. a new page. Now, once you're there, and I'm gonna pull up one that well, actually, I'll take you step by step. You just do create new and then you click CMA. There's also some other cool tools here that you're going to want to use, uh, but obviously today is about CMAs, so we'll just click on that. So once you're here, you put in your client's name and then you put in the property address. I wish you could put in the MLS number for whatever reason, they haven't figured that out yet. It would save a lot of clicking. Okay. One side note, if you're trying to do a CMA for a home in Kearns, it rarely comes up as Kearns. It usually comes up as Salt Lake, just so you're aware. It can be really frustrating. So this property, I already know of it because I own it. It's a three bedroom one and a half bath, so I'm gonna do 1.5, it's about 1180. Yeah, if the address, address is not on the MLS, it actually doesn't matter, Becky, because they're going to, you're putting in the, the information that it actually needs, um, just the square footage, bedrooms, bathrooms. That's why I say this is kind of the poor man CMA because it's working on such limited data, but I can show you how to make it at least a little more effective. What if we don't know the amount of bedrooms? We don't know if they've finished their, finished their basement. Um, obviously that's something you'll need to find out to get an accurate number, especially the finished basement. Bedrooms only add an extra thousand dollars to a CMA. So that doesn't okay. really matter. Bathrooms are more valuable. A full bath will add anywhere between three and 5,000. I mean, obviously the difference between four bedrooms and two bedrooms is valuable to buyers, but as far as an analysis goes, it doesn't add a lot for some reason. Did so you one, bathrooms add between three to 5,000? Yeah, bathrooms are between three to 5,000, depending on the area and obviously the finish work and all that stuff. We'll get into that a little bit later on as well. So once you've entered in that basic stuff, you can then do press fetch listings right here. I don't know, I, I'm guessing whoever created this was a had a lot of dogs as pets. So you're gonna go fetch these instead of <laughs> obtain them or I don't know what makes more sense to me. It just sounds funny to say fetch. <clears throat> so, it pretty much does a CMA for you just in a few clicks. It will tell you what the median is, what the lowest one was, what the average was, high, all that good stuff. Now here's, here's where I'm always like, okay, this is a cool tool, but you have to know how to do one yourself because look at this gap. Like if you go to your client's house and say, hey, here's a $100,000 gap on a $350 house, they're probably gonna be like, whoa, where, where, what do I do? I mean, obviously in this market, you could probably be a little bit more aggressive and say, you know, the medians that the highest is this. So I think we could, you know, it's your choice as the seller. Remember it's their choice, not ours. We have to let them choose. There's a $30,000 gap in this market. That's pretty safe because you know, your things are selling for more than they should anyway. So the odds of it going low are pretty slim unless it's garbage on the inside. So if you want to be, make this a better tool, then I would click on each one individually and look through their photos. And that will get, become a little bit closer to a custom CMA if you look through the photos. And then if you open this one and the photos make it look terrible, you could take that out. And then you look through this one and maybe the photos look better than the house, you'd take that out as well. So you're trying to get, and sorry, the computer's a little behind, so I know it's not checking the boxes. But when you uncheck a box on here, then it will adjust the values. <clears throat> so once you've done that, 
you can then click down here on customize report. And that's how you'll present it to your client. If you're just looking for a value, you can look through them and see what you think. Go ahead, Carmina. Um, so you just had three check marks. The first, wasn't it three on your last screen? No, there was about seven properties that were checked. But but it did pull a bunch more, right? Yeah, it pulled a, it pulled some other options. And I'm guessing those aren't as good of matches, but they want to give you extras. So if you want to look through all the options and pick the ones that are most similar on the inside, that's pretty that, good. That's where you look at the pictures, correct? Yep. Yeah, you can look at each one individually. And the, the, all the medium average price and the max were off of the ones that are checked, obviously, right? Yep. Exactly. All right, so let's see here. So now once you've done this, you can choose theme, color, you can do all sorts of stuff with it. It will automatically add all of this stuff into it right here. So you, you wanna take out stuff that you don't want in there before you present it to your client, or you can add stuff into it, understanding the listing contract, choosing a real estate professional. Like if you're going to a listing that you know you're going to be competing with other agents and you read through this and you think it sounds really cool, like it makes you sound good compared to what other agents might be doing, then you could include that in your packet. So all sorts of tools here. Some of them are good. Some of them I'm like, eh, I wouldn't, I would disagree with that advice. So make sure you look at it before you include it. For instance, I had one guy who printed out what to do when you're choosing a real estate agent and they had already decided on him but when they got the packet <laughs> they started reading through it and they're like he doesn't have this or that <laughs> it kind of worked against him he still got the listing but i'm like if it's your cousin or whatever and they're gonna use you i wouldn't recommend putting in a, a flyer about how to choose a realtor <laughs> don't want them second guessing you so Ray, can i ask a quick question uh -huh. Sorry, I'm super new. So is this cloud CMA, is that something we can just get online and use or do we need like an account or something or I've never made a CMA this way? It's free with the MLS. So the front oh, page, cool. MLS, it's just right here. Okay, thank you. Yep, no problem. Okay, so once you've done that, you can press publish report once you've chosen what you want in it and you picked how your cover letter is going to look, all of that stuff. And then you can email it directly to them. You can create a PDF. And I'm not going to go into it for the sake of time. Maybe we'll look at it later, but they make it look pretty good. I like the presentation a lot. You can also save yourself a ton of time and get in here. Whenever you get a new listing, you can put your listing in here and it will make a flyer. So you can, you don't need a pro agent um, website or top producer to make a flyer for your listing. You can just make one here and they actually look pretty good. I printed one the other day. So any questions on cloud CMA? Is there a way to incorporate this with the one you're doing on the MLS? Because obviously this is very low, like they don't have all the percentage of basement finished and all of that so that you can like import what you found on the MLS and then make the nice presentation. I, would, I don't know if there's a way to import from one to the other, but I would recommend not doing that because it will make you look more impressive if you um, bring several different CMAs. So I would do the one on the MLS, I'd do this one, and I'd do one of the other ones I, I'm gonna show you today. So you can say, hey, look, I did all of this for you guys. And once you're proficient at it, it won't take you a lot of time. Does that okay, make sense? thanks, yep. A lot of li listing presentations is showing off without being cocky anyway. So bringing several different cu custom analysis is, is gonna make you look really good. All right, so the next way to do one, or sorry, any other questions about the cloud CMA? Yes, um, I just got on, <clears throat> hi Brian, I got on uh, my computer just to follow along with you and put in an address of, a local neighbor. And so it brings up a lot of corresponding <clears throat> uh, closed um, sales. 
what was my question? Um, this is different. I've never done the cloud CMA before, so I appreciate you going through this. I forgot were, my question. You were going to ask where I got this really nice tie. That Back. was it. It's a $1 tie. I got it from a really cheap place, but thank you for noticing. <laughs> If you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself. It's fine. Okay. So any other thoughts or questions about Cloud CMA before we move to the next yeah, one? I do, Brian. Um, I I put in a house in the area is um, there. It's a modge podge, not really a modge podge. It's a high end area, you know, anywhere from 600 to a million. And yet um, there are, Old, older homes there and uh, land and things like that. So how do I accommodate for that? Um, it doesn't show any of those up here, you know, mm. when I get it. It's just showing what's closed, what's sold. I, I don't know. You can't do it with the cloud CMA, unfortunately. Okay, yeah. so you're gonna show us a way to do it, right? Yep. I exactly. knew you would, you're awesome, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right. I just realized that in the recording, I had it on gallery view, so you can see a ton of little boxes. So I'm gonna to have to fix that really quick. All right, that's better. Any other thoughts? All right, let's move on to the next one. I'm gonna, to... this one is Steve Perry's method. So if you've been to a, a CMA class by Steve Perry, you'll recognize this. And I know a lot of agents that use it. I would say it's probably a little bit more accurate than the cloud CMA, if you know what you're doing, um, or at least mostly know what you're doing, but it's still not nearly as accurate as a custom one, which Steve also knows how to do a custom one. So don't get me wrong, but he teaches this way because it's a little less confusing. So with this one, it's a little bit easier if you can find a previous MLS number. So that's that's the first thing I do. I try to find an old MLS number of the house just so I can compare it side by side without having to go back and forth. But if you can't, just make sure you have it written down in front of you what the square footage is and all that stuff. So I have an old MLS number for this from back when me and my business partner bought the house. And believe it or not, yes, it was only that much three years ago, <laughs> it's been insane. But <clears throat> when I look at this, I, I see a bunch of things that I'm gonna want to consider. One, I wanna compare it with Ramblers if I can. You don't wanna be comparing two stories with tri-levels, with bi-levels, with Ramblers, Victorians. Try to keep it the same. So check out the style, that's the first thing I do. Um, next, you're gonna wanna make sure you're comparing it to single family. Or if it was a townhome, you'd only compare it to townhomes. Townhomes and condos, the lines can kind of get blurred because a lot of it has to do with stuff that doesn't make logical sense. I've seen lots of condos that have three stories um, and stairs inside of the condo itself. So if you might leave both in, but just pay attention and make sure you're only comparing it with similar things. So then you're going to want to look at acreage and condition. So I'd say that's a good start. Just start with those things in mind. And then you're gonna head back over to the MLS. First, grab the MLS number. That's why I like finding the property, it makes it a little quicker. So I'll copy that, copy the MLS number. Then I'll head over here to search and I'll just search full. Now be careful, if it's a multi-level, you're not gonna be able to find it in this residential section. Whatever you're comparing, make sure you search in that section. Commercial, land, multi-unit are also here, but we're doing a residential property. So we'll start with this. Now we might not have time during the hour, but I'm gonna show you how to make this a lot less messy. But for now, we'll just deal with it. There's just a ton of data that we're not gonna use and it can make it a little bit daunting. But for now, I just want you to click on view map. That's the main thing. A view map, and then I choose a radius tool. It makes you click on the radius, and then it makes you click over here because they decided to add an extra step last year for no apparent reason. And I do one mile radius. And this is going to mirror 
what um, appraisers try to do. They try to keep it within a mile. They usually only go out if they have to. So the one mile radius is a lot better than doing it by zip code because you could have a home a tenth of a mile away that's in a different zip code in Utah. There's lots of different zip codes. So I try to do the radius tool rather than searching by zip code. So once you do that, you press set criteria and it will actually draw a neat little one mile circle around the subject property, which is really cool. So now what you can do is, I'm so tempted to go straight into a custom CMA because I'm like, we're like halfway there, but I'm gonna stop myself. So at this point, you can just click on each one or you can print them out and just look at them and compare them. These are active, that's important. In this market, these prices are probably gonna be pretty correct, right? But in a normal market, active and sold are very different. So just be aware of that. You don't wanna use active comparables to give your clients advice in every market. So what we're gonna look at is something that I usually don't recommend, and that is price per square foot. In order for price per square foot to be accurate, it has to be the same type of home. It has to be, which we didn't do yet. I'll have to fix that. It has to be very similar in square footage and the acreage and garage space need to be similar. Because if you have a 10 car garage house with a big giant shed in the back and on five acres and you're comparing price per square foot to the same size of house without a garage on a 10th of an acre, that's gonna be very inaccurate. So you have to be paying attention to those things we talked about, acreage, home type, even year built, if you're gonna compare price per square foot. So let's go back so I can fix that mistake I made. So you're, to go back and make changes, you just press refine search. So right here is where you change the style. So mine's a little rambler. So I'm only gonna see ramblers now that I did this. And then property type, you can technically do single family here. You're not gonna run into too many ramblers that are part of a condo complex. So you usually don't need to do both. But that narrows down the options quite a bit, which is good. So now that we've done that, um, oh, I cheated. I started going into a custom one again. My apologies. So back to the map report where we were before. And you'll have to forgive the MLS. We pay a lot of money to make sure it goes as slow as possible. Anybody have any good dad jokes while we wait for the MLS to load? appropriate good dad jokes. No comedians, huh? I wish I had a good dad joke, sorry, but you're doing a good job. <laughs> I haven't even told any yet. Oh, with the CMA, thanks. <laughs> that was probably a dad joke right there. Okay, so back here, Again, you're gonna give the most weight to the ones closest. So if you see something over here that's way more per square foot than this, but they're really similar, you might lean towards the ones that are closer to the subject property. But again, you're just looking through them. And if you've been in the house, then great, you can look through the photos. That makes this method even more accurate. So you can click through the photos, make sure it's similar. Oh, there's a good dad joke. I got to read it since I asked. Dogs can't do an MRI, but cats can. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> that is a good, good dad joke. So thank you for that. Whoever posted that, I didn't even see who it was. So to click through the pictures, obviously, you're just clicking through them. And say you see this one and you're like, wow, this, the condition of this one's really similar, really similar. And then you go down and you look at, OK, the basement's finished just like mine. There's, um, <clears throat> that's another one with this method. Make sure you check on the basement. Similar age, similar acreage. This one has a two car garage. Mine has a one car garage, probably at least close enough that I can somewhat depend on this, $202 per square foot. And then that's it. You're just, you're just using these one at a time to try and see um, what the average is. So you can just click on them, 
and you'll see a wild variation here. Uh, see, this is 222. That's 10% more per square foot with this one. So looking at it, it's the same lot, same age, same garages. It's a little bit bigger, but that doesn't matter because we're looking at square footage. So it's got to be condition. But again, these are active comparables. So there is a chance that these people are just overpriced. So you want to be paying attention to that. And if you're giving your client sound advice, you want to look at days on market as well. If one of them's $30 per square foot more than the other ones, and it's been on the market for two or three months, for instance, then you're going to not use that comparable. But this is a very simple way to do it. I know it seems like there's a few steps, but honestly, if you try this out on three or four houses, you'll, you'll get the swing of it pretty quick because we're not doing a ton of data entry. We're not doing a lot of detailed stuff. We are using a method that I absolutely don't like in Utah, price per square foot. You can get away with that in Louisiana and places like that because it doesn't vary so wildly. But in Utah, you need to be very aware of not giving clients bad advice, just basing things on price per square foot. But if it's within a few streets and it looks really similar and several of the comparables all support that price, then you can pretty safely be like, okay, so this one, let's pretend we went through all of them and this one was the highest, 222. And then the other one, let's say that was the lowest, that was 202. Then you can just pull out a calculator, do 202 times the square footage of your subject property. And that would, do we got it right here. <clears throat> Actually, I'm gonna go ahead and do that just so I can give you a real example. So we'll say that the highest we saw was 202 per square foot. We times that by the square footage of the house. 80, and that one goes to 240,000. So obviously that's not gonna be the highest one. And then the 222 per square foot, that only puts it up to 261. You see how wild of a difference this, these two methods are? The cloud CMA was putting the lowest at 240. This one, we've already found two that put it at 240 and 260. So maybe that 300 to 350 we saw from the cloud CMA might not be accurate. Something to think about. Because that would be too high, 300 yeah. and 350. Compared to these, that would be too high, but it's prompting me to look a little bit more into these because I'm. Yeah, see, 316. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> These are the going to be the remodeled ones. And that's why looking through photos is so important. I have no idea what they're thinking, though. This, this is not very remodeled. Maybe it's the, no, uh, I don't know. I don't know about this one. Oh, big detached garage. That probably helps a little bit. I don't know if that will sell. That's why I don't like using active comparables. This one puts it at 299. It's been on the market for 10 days, still unsold. So this, according to this method, if I was only using this one, I might start looking at 300,000 or below as my recommendation, unless the subject property was really nice on the inside. Because you can see from the outside, it's definitely not super nice but maybe they redid the yard since they bought it. Maybe they've really made it nice on the inside. I can tell you because this is the house I'm involved with. We've done some upgrades, but not a ton. So I'm starting to think more like 315 on the high end and maybe 260, 270 on the low end based, based on looking at all these active ones that we just looked at. And I, I could take the time and do the calculation comparing it to each one of these, but for the sake of time, we won't do that. And and that's a big gap between 260 and three or 315, right? That's a that's a forty thousand dollar kind of difference in price, correct? Between high and low. Well, and I mean the low one was 240 and the high one was 360, so it's a hundred and twenty thousand dollar difference. Okay. So how do you how do you deal with that? Like well, because these are active, and again, this isn't my favorite method. It's just easier because oh. these are, because these are active. Then 
I'll, I'll tend to write off the really high ones just as unrealistic sellers, but I definitely look through the pictures of each of them because you might see one that has marble floors and it's just everything's upgraded to the nines. And then the one that's at 240 has mold and maybe it's a meth house and you literally see a dead rat in the photo. I've seen all sorts of crazy stuff. <laughs> then you're like, okay, that's a maybe it's a good flip property if you could turn it into 360 and put 50 grand into it. But condition is so key, especially in Utah and Salt Lake County. You just need to look through the pictures and really base it on condition, which takes a little bit of practice, but not a lot. Like you can see here that that carpet's not terrible. It's not all torn up. These walls at least are painted, you know, it looks clean, it might be a little dated, but at least it looks clean. So if, if yours is similar to this, then you're gonna lean more towards that 222 per square foot. But again, I can't remind you enough, this is active comparables. Yeah, okay. So any questions on this before I move to the easiest method? Um, when you talk about days on market, what's like the number that's like, okay, that's been on the market too long? Um, it can be a little deceiving and I might try to find one to give you an example. Let's see about this one, 31 days on market. So at first glance, you might say, oh, this one is overpriced because it's been 31 days on market. But then you look over here and it's actually active, but it's got a time clause on it. So they have a contract. So what I'm gonna do is click on history to get the true story. Days on market is meaningless without knowing the history of the listing. So when you click on the history, it will tell you every time it's gone under contract, out of contract, and when it did. So this one went under contract on the 8th of July. So that's 11 days ago. Um, so 11 days ago puts it at before it went under contract, it was on the market for 20 days. But then I'm going to look at this. Oh, but they had it over 400,000, which excludes a ton of searches. You know, how many buyers do we all have that cap their search at 400 even? So they, they were excluding themselves from a lot of buyers until the 25th. And then they lowered the price to under 400,000. So then I'm looking at as more like it was on the market for 12, 13 days before they got an offer at that price. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, got to do a little bit of investigation, which again, it gets lengthy, but this is what we're, this is what we're paid to do. This is what separates us from apps and AI, the different things that they can come up with. Like, I mean, I showed you one of the better apps in the cloud CMA, and we're already seeing holes in it as we even do this most basic of CMA methods with active comps. So, Learning this is going to be what keeps you in the business, no matter what um, Elon Musk and all the <laughs> all the geniuses in this world come up with. We're we're going to have a job as long as we can do what we're talking about today. And Brian, so why why would somebody use the, the uh, cloud CMA versus this other one if if this is more accurate? Well, the cloud CMA takes almost no skill, so it's a good starting point. And it's good to cross-reference. Like normally there wouldn't be such a big discrepancy. Cloud CMA is a pretty okay tool. Like, um, and there really isn't a big discrepancy. As you can see, they probably used this comparable and that one was $100 per square foot more. That's 33%. So it's not necessarily a bad tool, but this neighborhood specifically has such a big variety of remodeled houses and unremodeled and the prices are all over the place that the cloud CMA is gonna be way too broad. And so is this, so you need to be a little bit better. Generally, I think cloud CMAs will probably give you more of like a $50,000 gap instead of a hundred. And it's just, I would never just do one CMA and call it good, even at this stage in my career. Like I said, I've done over 10,000 of these. I would still do a normal CMA and cross-reference it with one of my other methods, just to make sure. I just don't wanna ever, you know, with the MLS, you can, what were we doing? Let's see if we can go back. When we were doing our searches um, over here, 
hide map. Sometimes the MLS will grab something from what you did earlier and it will put it into your current search. Like it might, if you're searching estimated taxes for some weird bizarre reason, and you don't wanna look at anything higher than $2,000 taxes, actually let's make it more realistic, $1,000 taxes. And then next week you decide to do a CMA, you might get in. And because you did that, look, it went from 16 matches to one because all of those taxes were over a thousand except for that one. So if you're not, if you're not double checking your work in two or three different ways, you could make a teeny little mistake like that. And all of a sudden you only have one comparable for that property instead of 16. And the MLS can be pretty glitchy. Like it, it's done that to me, even a month after I've searched something, it reinserts it out of the blue. And I'm searching and I'm like, I don't feel like this CMA is right. And then I look over on the left side, sometimes it will, the search criteria will appear right here. See this little drop down? Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, what in the world? <laughs> it's taken out half my comparables for something I searched a month ago. You know, what's, what's, um, what's interesting is that if your clients find a home that you have, that, that, that your searches or your um, uh, listing alerts haven't, haven't uh, send it to their email, but they found a home that where did this home come from? I, I've had that happen. Or, you know, or, or CMAs uh, where in one it pulled that home and I, after doing more than one in this, like in, in this, in, within the same days, I'm like, where did the house go that I pulled just a couple of days ago? So it's happened to me. Yeah, it's, you just have to be careful. And that's why no matter how good you get, you need to cross-reference it with other sources. Mm -hmm. So look at the one that was left over. It was a mobile home. <laughs> so good luck using that for your comparable if you accidentally left that text information on there. So let's and go. To Ryan. The... Yeah, go ahead. I think like they show $1 as a tax and $750 as a homeowner association fee. Right, because they with that that was a mobile home, so that's not even anything you would ever compare a Rambler to, but it's all that was left after I took the taxes down under a thousand. So you just have to make sure you're cross-referencing your work. And anytime you do a CMA, this is the best advice I could give you about a long-term habit. Do this drop down every time and just see what you what's in there before you just take this number to the bank, however many matches there are because you might see something in there that you didn't mean to put there. Does that make sense? So a little bit better of way of doing that, and it's within the same method, but it might be a little more accurate, is you can always simply change it from actives to solds. You could even do solds, backups, and under contracts and remove actives. And then let's get rid of that silly tax thing I put in there. And Brian, that was my question. I didn't understand why we weren't looking at solds. In my mind, I would only want to reference, I would only want to look at solds. Yeah. Because actives would be all over the place. Looking at solds was a little bit too close to the custom CMA. So I wanted to show you the active option. And also, gotcha. also because a lot of times there's more actives than there are solds. So. Okay. You could do all of them at once. You just have to be aware of which one you're looking at. But I always recommend doing them completely separately because sold is very different than under contract because they might have offered 30,000 above or below list price and you would never know. So mm -hmm. you can do the exact same thing I just showed you just with solds and we're kind of tight on time. So I won't do that right now, but it's the same method. Make sure it's similar and then Make sure that you're looking at the looking at the condition, everything we just went over. So now the way to do it that is essentially cheating, but it's okay to cheat if it gets you ahead in life. No, never mind. It's <laughs> it's okay to take a shortcut every now and then. Let me rephrase that. Hopefully you guys like my humor and you're not just rolling your eyes. But what you can do is you can just take the address. Put it into Google and you might be shocked, but I will actually look at the Zestimate. 
I'm not too prideful to admit when someone has come up with a good tool. And the Zestimate, as you can see, is not a terrible tool. We're, we're always told, oh, it's always off, it's always off. Um, obviously, that's a blanket statement that's not true. Sometimes it's correct. But there's two reasons why you should look at the Zestimate. One, it's so fast, it can be your third point of reference. You can do two different CMAs and then check Zillow. It takes two seconds like you just saw. So it's good to have it as your third one that will support, hopefully support your other two. But the real reason you need to be looking at that is guess what your owner thinks his home is worth when you walk through the door. Anybody want to take a guess? 338,900. <laughs> that gets you a Lunetta gift card, Carmina. Good answer. Yeah. You're great. <laughs> Text Paul and tell him you won a $5 gift card. So this is, I mean, good 80, 90% of the time you're going to walk in the house and not only this, but they might be like, oh, but mine's nicer. So I bet I could get 370 or 380. The odds are your client has looked it up on Zillow and they think that no matter what it looks like on the inside, this is how much their home is worth minimum, not maximum minimum. So that's another reason to pull up Zillow because you want to have it as a tool in front of you. I would even go far as to print out Zillow, especially if it's inaccurate. So then when I sit down with the client, I can say, hey, here's the value according to this CMA. Here's the value according to this one. And here's, unfortunately, Zillow just takes an average of all the homes. They didn't do the research I did. So they put it here, which is a little high, but I wanted you to at least see that that's what they put it. Um, sometimes I'll do that on purpose because I know they've looked at Zillow. I don't necessarily want to pull that out if they haven't looked at Zillow or I'm not sure, but if they've if they seem like the type of person that would have checked Zillow, I will go as far as to even print that out and bring it along as a bad example. So then they don't even want to go there because <laughs> you show them the good examples and you're like, I printed out Zillow, but clearly, you know, their algorithms didn't work on this one. So we're going to lean on these two. And they don't want to be like, oh, but wait, wait, I believe them more than you after they see the great work you did. So it's a good tool to have either way. So Brian, go ahead. Um, on the cloud CMA, when you actually print it out, it gives you um, an estimate that comes from Zillow also. It comes from Zillow, it comes from a bank, it does, you know, it has three different resources and they do a median on that too. And so it it's pretty much the same too. All right, you get a gift card as well because you taught me something today. So that will save you a step if you're doing a cloud CMA. Sounds like you can just get in there and do that. I'm going to put Paul's number in the remarks so you guys can text in for your gift cards. No cheating. If I hear anybody but the two of you texted Paul for gift cards, <laughs> you're going to be in trouble. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. I don't know if this will earn me a gift card, but um, <laughs> on the, <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when you're doing the CMA, I don't, did you mention anything about school districts or do you just leave that? I, I mean, would, I wouldn't use that for a CMA, no. Well, yeah, so for, I guess, I guess true. Well, I was trying to look up uh, a house in a neighborhood and see what sold around it. But with just the address, well, I feel like, okay, yeah, I guess I don't need to do that, do I? Okay. Yeah, I mean, if, if your client, if you're helping a buyer and they want it in a school district, that's when you'd use that search tool, but not for a right. single. Right, right. Okay. Okay. I think I got Paul's correct phone number in there. So the two of you that I just said want a gift card, make sure you text him and tell him Brian said so. And if he complains, then he can deal with me, but he couldn't, <laughs> make, he couldn't make it today. He won't give you a hard time. All right. That's the thing with sponsoring classes now. You don't even have to spend money on food, so you better be giving us some gift cards, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So those are the first three methods. And I guess the, the second one I showed you was kind of two if you want to do actives and under contracts. But those are the first three. And now 12 minutes isn't a lot. So I'm going to go through it quick, and then I'm going to go through it slow. So if anybody can stay past the hour, 
we'll dig into our second hour a little bit. Um, for those of you who have never been here, we do the Ask the Coach Hour for the second hour. So we'll dig into that a little bit to do a little bit deeper of a dive into the custom CMA just because it's so important. But I'll at least do it quickly so you can rewatch the recording and see how to do it. All right. So also during the Ask the Coach Hour, I will probably show you how to customize this so it's less messy. But let's go ahead and get rid of some of these so we won't go faster. Let's go ahead and show you how to do a custom one. So you do the same thing. You go under full and it will look like this, just what we've been looking at. Again, it's always a good habit to press clear criteria at the start to make sure that hopefully it deletes everything out of these boxes. And then I'm only gonna compare it to start with, with solds. Because if I can get enough data from solds, that's, that's what I prefer. Again, in an unprecedented market like we had for the last six months, maybe I would also wanna see actives and under contracts just to see where the prices are going. But my entire career before this, I only would do solds. It worked out well for me. This probably won't be a thing for a while, but I always exclude short sales because those are gonna skew the results. Uh, oftentimes short sales will go for way less than they're worth. And that's why investors are just waiting for those to start coming again. And then, like we said, we'll do style. And I, I like to pull it up on a separate page so I can go back and forth because I, I don't have a great memory to remember all this. So it's a rambler, you know, these are the, I'm showing you the highlights of things you should be looking at. So style is one and then year built is also very important. So here's a tricky thing with this. We'll go ahead and put the style in. This is what's gonna take practice. And I'd recommend just grabbing some old properties and doing CMAs on it. The year built is not an exact science. Um, and I might transition the, okay, here it is, year built. It's not an exact science because with newer homes, I like to make it tighter. With older homes, I make it a little bit bigger. Where is that line? Honestly, for me, it depends which city it's in. That's how detailed my custom CMAs have become. But as a general rule, I would say, try really hard to get it within 10 years and then expand out. And when you're doing a custom CMA, luckily you can expand as much as you want. I'll tell you, if it's older than 1970, you can pretty safely go 15, 20 years in either direction because at that point, it's just a really old house. Everything needs to be replaced or has already been replaced. This one was built in the 50s. So I'm gonna put a cap on 1975. And then oftentimes with homes that old, I won't even put a minimum, but maybe just to make sure we don't get any historic houses, I'll just put in like 1925. So that gives us about 30 years on the bottom, 20 years on the top. But again, I would recommend just starting with 10 above and 10 below. But for the sake of time, we're gonna zoom out because I think we might need to anyway. Now square footage, again, that's not an exact science, but if you start 500 above and 500 below, you're pretty safe. As the houses get bigger, I make that bigger. On an 8,000 square foot house, I might go to 11,000 and down to six, depending on the neighborhood and stuff. But 500 above, 500 below as a starting point is a good idea. There's not gonna be anything <laughs> that I wanna compare it to that's 600 square feet. So I'm just gonna go about 500 above, up to 1700 square feet. And you'll see this number here is changing. Every time I make an adjustment here, it takes out comparables. So up at the top, we did sold, we did the style, we did what we wanted to exclude. Now, sold date, you wanna to try to be within three months to start. So it's gonna automatically put it at a year. So you've gotta click forward nine times to get that three months. One, two, three, four, there you go. So I go back three months and it's the 19th. So I'll just do that. Now we're down to 473 results. See how we're whittling these, these down. Every time we do something, it becomes more accurate. Now you could get, I don't think two car garage homes compare very well to three car garage. So you could get really fancy and go into the garages and stuff. But more often than not, what we just did is almost sufficient. All you need to do now is what I already taught you how to do. 
and that's go to the map section. Go to the map section, select radius like I talked about. Do one mile. And honestly, when I'm trying to get a really accurate CMA, I'll start at a quarter of a mile just to see if there's enough comparables. But you can comfortably go out to a mile usually. There are some exceptions, which I'll go into. Yeah. Got that. We've got a lot of comparables. <laughs> so let's go back and we're doing it in reverse order. Usually I'll start closer and zoom out, but today I'll start further out and zoom in. All right. We got a half a mile here. This here's another glitch. This is something that it does. See how I changed it to half a mile, but it's still including the mile. When that happens, you have to press the X to get rid of everything and then just do this again. And that will fix it. Now, a little tip. Um, now you know your subject property is there. Say that over here is just a really messy neighborhood. Say nobody maintains their lawns, they're really old houses. Maybe it's right next door to a big grocery store and it's just, and then your client's house, maybe it's in a really nice neighborhood, well manicured or even a gated community. And you're like, I really don't think it should be compared to those ones. There's a really cool tool that you can actually do this. Right here, you can draw the boundary or you can use this to point and click a polygon. Either one of them, you can do this and exclude entire areas and just draw your own boundary. So, if you, once you know areas well enough, you might use that. But normally I just tell people to stick to the radius. That's just a little bit easier. And it gave us lots of comparables, right? So now I hide map 17 comparables. It's a little excessive, but you want at least eight or nine. So it's better to have too many than too little. At that point, I'm pretty much ready to go to the next step. And that is view results. And we're gonna, instead of looking at them one at a time, I'm gonna skip straight to the end and then go through them one at a time. So I select all of them to begin with. And then I go to CMA report on the dropdown. Now they've added this. So you have to do universal archive values. Um, if you want to do no concessions, you can, but that's just another step. So once you've done that, you are ready to add the subject property. And I, I made a, I made a terrible mistake. I clicked on create new, don't do that. So populate subject data is where you want to go. And that's why I love when there's an old MLS report, because I can just copy and paste over the MLS number. Now, a word of caution, some people have done additions, some people, maybe the last agent recorded something wrong and put zero bedrooms, zero bathrooms in there. We've seen all sorts of mistakes on the MLS, right? So don't just do this and think you're good, but as long as the previous listing is still accurate, it will autofill all of these things. So it will save you, I don't know, one minute, two minutes. I got to the point that I could do a CMA in three minutes. so. Anything that can save me time, I get excited about. So it autofills everything, obviously verify, make sure it's good. And now- Brian, oh, yeah. uh -huh. um, can't you go in to where it's autofilled and make changes if you know there are changes to be made? Yep, exactly. So you can autofill it. And then if you're like, oh, they actually added a bathroom, you can change that to two and watch how it changes. It's 316, then it goes up to 321. Like I said, a full bathroom's worth about three to 5,000. If I instead added a, another half bath, then it would probably only add 2,500. Let's see if that's right. Yep, 2,500. So that's where you can always go in there and make changes. But if it auto fills and everything's right, you saved yourself a ton of time. And either way, you save yourself time because if you don't know the exact layout of how much square footage is on each level, Again, you're depending on somebody else's work, so you wanna double check, but it'll get you to the finish line a little quicker. So 
So now is the and Brian, remind him that county records are not correct. <laughs> yes, good point. Um, oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes square footage is there's a contradiction not only between county records, but also between appraisals. I've had two different appraisals give me different square footages within the same month. So you just have to do the best you can. But if you have an appraisal from the owner or if they have building plans, those will probably be a little more accurate than county records. But that's why in your listings, you always say buyers required to get their own measurement because you definitely don't wanna be held accountable for wrong square footage. So now this is what separates the professionals from the not professionals. It's time to really dig into each of these and every detail about it. So I will look a little bit at this stuff. Um, say ours was only one bedroom or two. I'm going to take out stuff that has four or five bedrooms because it's a different type of buyer, right? They're looking for different things. Um, you're going to look at acreages. 16, 16, 16, 18, 18. These are all pretty similar. So I'll leave those in. Um, maybe you see a house. This is all one level. Maybe we see one that's got basements. Man, the same builder must have built all these. This is a very big wealth of comparables. So I'm gonna feel very comfortable pricing this out. So <clears throat> didn't need to make any changes there. Bathrooms, I wouldn't stress too much about those, but now's the painstaking process. And this is why I would prefer to only have eight or nine is I look through the photos of every single one. Now, don't think the we're gonna do that today. Don't worry about it. <laughs> don't get scared. I'll just look at one or two. So I'm clicking on the photos of this one. And okay, so it's basic landscaping, but at least there's not tons of weeds. Looks like the carpet's new. Shower's somewhat updated. Vanity's somewhat updated, obviously simple, but updated. Looks like they've got some good updates in this one. I'm gonna go ahead and remove this because I know what the inside of the one I'm working on looks like, and it's not as nice as this one. So you just hit this remove button right here. Now watch this. So this is the compared value for this comp. If you compare our subject property to only this, this is what we would list our subject property at. This is the average of all 17 comparables. So when I remove this, the average is 316, right? If I remove this, it drops the average down to, come on, we're waiting, 314. Only took away 2000 because there's too many comps. But as we go through it and take stuff out, then it's gonna slowly go down and down and down until it's a much smaller margin. And let me show you an example of one that we'd take out because it's not as nice. I'm guessing this one is. So I've got this one. It does not have a garage, so that's the first clue. Even a one-car garage, if you can close it and keep your stuff safe and not get in the rain to go inside your house, that's a good benefit. So this does not have a garage. Mine does have a one-car garage. Landscaping's pretty nice, but there you go. It's completely dated. These might be updates from the 50s, like maybe it was redone in the 70s, but it's definitely has not been redone in the last 10 or 15 years. So I'd take that one out. So you're going through each one and doing that. So again, if we take that out right now, the average is 314. Which one was it? Is it this one? Then it's gonna go back up again after that. Just need to give it a couple minutes to load. 317. So I'll go back and forth, back and forth. Um, I'd love to go through that whole process with you so I can tell you what my custom value would be. But again, for the sake of time, we'll stick, skip to the next step. This is the last step. And that is, if you're still not quite sure or if there's still too big of a gap, I will click on the address of each one and I will drive through the neighborhood without spending a penny on gas. You click on this and you jump down into Google, roads and you can drive around. Just click the buttons and you're driving through town. 
And what I like, the reason I like to do this is I like to pay attention to the quality of the homes and also see how busy the road is. If I'm on Google and I'm seeing tons of cars around me and in front of me and behind me, then I know that this is probably a pretty busy road. Whereas, yes, this is a double yellow line, but it's not that busy. Who knows what time of day this is? Obviously, I'm not going to take this to the bank and say this is not a busy road. You can look at traffic reports. You can go into all sorts of other details, which are on the MLS, by the way. But just to quickly go through stuff, if I see this and mine is in a cul-de-sac, at the end of the cul-de-sac, and all the lawns are perfectly manicured, then I might take this one out because it's just not looking as nice on the outside with the road. So I like to do that just to make sure it, it kind of makes it so you can be an expert on the home without knowing the area. Because that's the biggest complaint, especially people that um, are used to real estate the way it used to be done. Like I had a woman once who, me and my brother were listing her house and this was early on in my career. I just went to go get signatures. I didn't know anything about what was going on. And I met her at her job and she's like, you know, you really shouldn't sell home outside of the area. You're expert in. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Just sign on the line. And she's like, I looked at your guys' sales and most of them are in Utah County. This is Salt Lake County. You guys don't know what you're doing. And I'm just like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> you're not my client. It turns out her and her brother disagreed. They owned the house together. Her brother hired us. And um, it pretty much was true back in the day, but now we've got all these cool tools, you know, the cool, the tool to be able to drive through the neighborhood and look at it, all these different things we're doing. I can do a CMA in Eden, Utah. I can do it in Brigham City. I can do it in Kanab and I can get it spot on. So if you get good at this, that rule does not apply anymore, which opens you up to much bigger earning potential. So let's go to the last phase of this. Once you've picked which ones you want, then you're going to create a CMA packet. And that's when it's going to add all sorts of cool tools. If you're with your seller, I would add the seller's proceeds page. Or if you know their payoff and stuff, you might add that. But in general, I just do the cover sheet. You can do medium or full comps. Full comp just means it's got more data and it's one property per page. In this case, I'd probably do medium because I don't want it to be a 50 page packet that I give to the seller. Do not do comp photos if you're printing it out unless you want to, the printer to print you an absolute book of stuff. Um, don't even do photos if you're not printing it out. It'll take forever to load and it'll make it really messy. Comparison report, summary analysis, and map report. So those are the five I'll usually do. Cover sheet, medium comp details, comparison report, summary analysis, map report. Once you've done that, this is what it will look like when you print it out. Who's got the Jeopardy music? Okay, there we go. So I like to do custom cover pages. I should have showed you that because it looks nicer but it will at least put your name and the property address. Then it gives them all the comparables <clears throat> and then it shows them exactly what we were looking at. So I can go through with them and I can say, hey, this one was as nice on the inside as yours, but it had kind of a bad yard. So that one compares it at 280. Um, and then I can show them this one. I can say, hey, this one's a little bit nicer than yours on the inside. And it's a little bit nicer than yours also on the outside. It puts it at 320. Um, obviously I'd be delicate with how I say this to a client, but you get the idea. I'm showing them these and showing them what the average is. And then in a listing appointment, I'll usually say, so the range is between 280 and 340. I'm not going to like sugarcoat it at first because I want to make sure they know how low it could go. I'm not afraid of the low number because it helps with expectations. Even if theirs is for sure worth 300, which I think we will get that if we sold it. Even if it's for sure worth 300, if the lowest comp in there puts it at 270, I'm gonna say 270 on the low end because you're setting them up for the right thinking that there might need to be price drops and it might not sell for what they think it will. 
but I'll then give them a second one. So I'll say, okay, so on the low end, we've got one at 270, which obviously would be terrible, but it did happen with this comp. We've got one at 340. And obviously we, I showed you how that one looks and it's really nice. So we probably wanna rule that out. My recommendation would be somewhere in the 290 to 320 range. You know, I'll give them a $30,000 gap. Then I let them choose. It's got some other tools here that I think are helpful for them to look at. And then I like the map report because it really helps when explaining it to them. I can be like, hey, you know, your property's here. This is the one that puts it at 320. This is the one that puts it at 315. This one puts it at 340. These are the ones that put it at 240, 238, you know, and then so they can kind of see what my logic is. The reason I'm saying we should price it higher than those is because the ones that are closer are selling for more, right? So the map is a great tool because you can kind of walk them through why you're thinking the way you're thinking. And that is a custom CMA, um, very effective tool. I can do, I can usually do one of these just basic, like I said, in about three minutes. But if I'm gonna click through all the photos and drive through the neighborhoods and really do it detailed, it's gonna take even at this point, a good 20 to 30 minutes for me to do a quality comparative market analysis. Um, but I don't want to, well, I guess I am guessing, but don't take me for my word on this. I think I usually land about 10,000 on any CMA I do. It will sell within 10,000 of wherever I put it. Most recently, I, I did a comparative market analysis for my listing um, in, where was it? I guess I can't tell you where it was because then I would be disclosing um, appraisal information. But it was interesting because he wanted me to list it at 650. And I showed him the comparables, I showed him my CMA, and we agreed to list it at 625. But I told him my range is 550 to 600. I gave him a little bit bigger of a range. And he says to me, so where, where does your gut tell you it's going to sell? Because I know you're not supposed to tell me, Brian, but where does your gut tell you? And I'm trying really hard not to give him a number. And he said, just tell me if, if tomorrow you woke up and saw we got an offer for blank amount, what would it be? And I said, well, I don't think you'll get an offer for this, but if, if I were to guess what it would appraise for, I'd say 575. So we ended up getting an offer for pretty close to list price. Appraisal came back at 576. So it's, it's interesting that once you get good enough at this, you will be as good as an appraiser at valuing properties. This is all they do. They just learn how to do these different things. And once you're using the same comparables, the exact same comparables a good appraiser will use, you're gonna run into a lot less of those terrible times when you overprice a home, you promise your client the world, and then the appraisal comes in low. At least you'll have built realistic expectations for them. Because my clients, it was really cool that they're like, hey, Brian, it looks like you are 100% right. Obviously we're disappointed, but it was impressive to them because they knew that I knew what I was doing. Any, I mean, I'm sure there's a million questions about the custom CMA, it's a lot more confusing. But um, for those of you who are new, <clears throat> we generally at 11 will switch to the Ask the Coach Hour, which is just open for any questions about real estate, prospecting, mindset, whatever you want to do. But a lot of times we'll spill over because there's so many questions. So feel free to ask questions about CMAs to start with. But um, and if we have time, I might even go over a fifth, a fifth way of verifying values. Um, but I'm not going to do it because it's not accurate right now with the inflation that we're seeing. So hey, uh, questions. Um, <laughs> now I just thought, lost my question. Um, well, I just fire hope like a million ways of doing a CMA. So <laughs> I apologize. Oh, okay. Have you ever, have you used the, um, I used to do it this way. And then I would take a class at, um, the board about two years ago that showed where you click on the CMA and do it that way, where if you have the MLS number, that it takes all of that information that you just customized and puts it in for you. Have you used that before? I, I used it a few times, um, maybe a few years ago. And when I realized it wasn't as accurate as my custom one, I just didn't use it again. I'm sure it will give you similar data to the cloud CMA though. 
So if, if you're familiar with that, um, then that would be a good way to cross-reference your work most likely. And then I also wondered why you use the calendar to go forward instead of putting 90 days back down below. Sorry, right. my audio is a little bit. Could you repeat the end of that question? I said I wondered why you use the calendar to go forward your 90 days instead of putting in the 90 days back. That's a couple things below. Is there a reason? Uh, or I don't know. Oh, just because it, automat <laughs> it automatically sets it a year back, so you have to click forward. Unless you go to 90 days and take that little check mark out, and then it goes. It just seems oh, yeah. like. Yeah, you could do that too. Just so it's the same, same thing, right? Put yeah. it in the calendar versus just putting the number of dates back. Yeah. Same thing. Okay. I'm just a creature of habit. It didn't always have all the cool little shortcuts. <laughs> I guess I also like it because then I can just adjust it. Like sometimes I'll want to do 65 days if if the holiday, like say Christmas just happened and I don't want to compare anything that sold before Christmas because nobody wants to offer on a home, you know, a week before Christmas, then I might go down to 85 days or whatever. So uh -huh. it gives me a little more flexibility. But so, if so, you don't have specific questions, but you just want me to redo a certain section, feel free to ask for that as well. Go ahead, Carmina. Okay, so we have a cloud CMA. What was the name of the second one? The second one I did, it was just, it was the square footage approach. Not my favorite, but you can compare it to active, solds, and under contracts. Just, you're doing a little bit of what we did. You're still doing a mile radius. You're trying to compare it to the same size of home. So you're taking a lot of the steps towards a custom one. You're just not going all out. You're just doing the basic data, making sure it's a similar house, similar interior and then comparing the price per square foot. And then you can just calculate, you just times the amount of square footage of your subject property by the price per square foot that you want. Okay, okay, that makes sense. And then the third one is the custom CMA, right? The what? No, the, the third, third one is yellow, and then the fourth one I did was custom. So. Well, uh, then what was the third one again? Zillow. Oh, Zillow, okay. You forgot because you sneezed and it was over. I just put the address in and <laughs> we saw it on Zillow. Somebody asked yeah. in the remarks. Somebody asked in the remarks where I, what I did to look at the Google Maps. So once you've selected all the properties and you're within the CMA, you can do them all in one place. You can at any time click on any of the addresses to get there. But once you're in the CMA and it's right here. This is where I do photos and everything. So I just do it from here. You click on the address. You can tell it's clickable because it's blue. And then you press this little guy and he drops himself down into the thing. You can also do satellite view and hybrid if, if you want to look and see what's next to schools, what's like this house, for instance, if this is one of your comparables, and its view is this big store and it's on a road that goes through behind the store. Then that can give you some hints. Whereas another comparable might be right on the same road and it doesn't back up to a department store. So there's, there's all sorts of cool tools you can use in here. Hybrid will look like this. Gives you the names of some things. Did that answer? They did their question in the remarks. So thank I'll... you for that. That's very helpful. I never knew about that. Yeah. Somebody asked me at the start of class, how long will it take you to teach me about CMAs? And I told them about 30 hours. <laughs> we could sit here and go through all the different things that I look at and it would give you guys a headache. But you'll start doing the other things naturally as you practice. You don't need to learn how to do every little thing because when you're practicing and you see, oh, I was $30,000 off again, what am I doing wrong? Then just the more you look into it, you might be like, oh, duh, I was comparing homes with three car garages to homes with two car garages, which is a total different category of buyer. You know, three car garage is usually, I mean, not usually, but 
Sometimes it can signify more wealth because they have more cars than they need, or maybe they have a boat and they need third car garage, which again is wealth. So it's a little bit different than just a, the expense of buying a new, a third car garage instead of two. That actually brings up one thing I should show you guys. I hate to dig so far into the Ask the Coach Hour. Hopefully none of you have too many questions, but when you're comparing these, you really should be looking at, let me see if I can get back there without messing everything up we just worked on. Probably not. I'll just grab one of them. So you really should be looking at this. Um, this. This tool is not perfect, the custom CMA tool. It still has its flaws. So when we put these things in here, it will only give you a specific amount for a garage, but it's very different than the cost of actually adding a third car, right? So that's one of the problems with this. If you look at this, this one has, well, I guess that's one thing I, I never changed. Look, I made the mistake I warned you guys not to make. <laughs> we, we enclosed the carport into a garage after we bought it. So <clears throat> this has a one car garage now. So if you compare it to one with zero cars, it only gives us $5,000 for a garage. And we all know, unless it's made out of cardboard boxes, a garage costs more than $5,000 to build. So you wanna keep, keep an eye on stuff like that, especially when it comes to like a big shed. Like if someone has a 10 car shed in their backyard made out of brick, same finish work as the house. Look, adding those 10 is only gonna add $40,000 to the CMA. To build a 10 car garage out of brick that matches the trim of the house, you're looking at 200,000, maybe more. So it's, the garage section is something you need to be really cautious of, especially once you get into two, three, four car garages, detached buildings, stuff like that. Again, I could go on, on and on all day, but. And how would you find accurate information on, like I sold one a few years ago with a six car garage and how, how would I price that? That's going to be one of the common questions. It's going to, a lot of it's going to be experience. So for example, if you go to the property and it's made out of, if it's an outbuilding like the metal buildings, the metal frame buildings, obviously you're not going to give that the credit that you would give one that's made out of the same materials as the house with stucco and whatever the house is made out of. So you keep stuff like that in mind and also um, the area. But the more spaces it has, the less credit you would give it. If it goes from a one car to a two car, I'd easily do 10,000 instead of 5,000. So whatever this number comes out to, I'd just add another 5,000. Same thing with a car to a three car. I think, I think that's more than $5,000. I think it's 10. But once you're going from like five, six, seven, eight, nine, maybe it's more accurate at $5,000 per extra garage depending on how it's finished. Because you probably won't get your money back, like with any upgrade. If you spend 200,000 on a 10 car garage, just so that it looks really nice on the outside, if somebody doesn't want a 10 car garage, they're not gonna offer 200,000 extra for your house. So I think 5,000 is way too low. They need to adjust that. But I don't think that, um, Again, it's an experience thing. You have to look at condition of the garage just like you would with the house. And there is, a, there is an edit comp mode that you can do where you can go in and do your own stuff to change things. Um, but yeah, that's for a different day. I have a question on, um, I have a house, um, that's in really, really, really bad shape. Like, and the comps I just tried to pull on it, um, I, there weren't any that were in that that kind of condition. It's gonna, oh, I would think it would be an investor. Like it needs, it has holes in the roof, holes in the floor, leaking water into the downstairs. Like the cabinets need to be replaced. The, the uh, floor is all torn up. Like it's bad. Um, how would you, 
how would you price that? Is there any kind of rule? Like you said, you work with investors a lot. Well, luckily, for us, unless it's in a really remote area, then usually the market will fix some of your mistakes. So <clears throat> with investor properties, especially right now with all the investor groups that are out there, they'll usually bid it up to where it should have been anyway. But you, you still want to give your client accurate information. So I, I, I've used several different methods. I'll try to guess how much it would cost to get it up to par with the other homes and minus out an extra 20% or so. Because usually somebody flipping a property wants to make 20 to 30% profit. So to give you an example, if you pull out your calculator, say all of the comps are putting it at 300,000 and this one is so bad that it would cost $75,000 to get it fixed up to be as nice as those. I might price it, you know, 300,000 minus 75 would be 225, but usually there's room in there to make a profit for a flipper. So I might price it all the way down at 200,000 in a normal market. Right now today, you could probably get 250 out of that, even though it's gonna cost 75 to get it as nice as the $300,000 ones. But normally you'd, you'd price it out to where somebody could make money flipping it is my best advice. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be, there's gonna be times where I'm lost in a CMA, no matter what you do or who's doing it, you know, Jennifer Yeo, Steve Perry, people have been in the industry and sold a million houses. They'll, they'll get stuck on a CMA in Rudolph, Utah that has, you know, 20 acres and it's a 200 square foot house. Like there's always going to be some bizarre like home that you're just like, I don't know what to do with this. So sadly, in those cases, you sometimes have to do your best. You sometimes have to expand out five, 10, 15 miles and break all the rules we just went over. And even then, sometimes you just can't find it. And that's when you have to let the market decide and just price it to the best of your ability. Let the seller decide where to put it and then see what buyers choose to pay. Can we change gears a little bit? Is this yeah. like ask, ask the coach? Um, I've got some for sale by owners um, I'd like to work with. And so I wonder if you could share some information on how to work with those for sale by owners. Yeah, what's, um, what strategy are you using right now? I am not, I, well, what I, with the one, I just asked him if I could come and see it and told him I was a realtor and he said, Sure, and he, we just talked a little bit about it. <clears throat> I don't have a buyer per se, <clears throat> but I would like, but I'm gonna drum one up. And then I have two others that I just came across. So I, today, just this morning, so I um, want to get some information before I approach them. What I, what I was going to do with them is, is again, just um, call them and you know, tell them I'm a realtor I don't, I don't, you know, I don't mind doing that and just ask them, you know, specifics about the house. Yeah. Um, and I, I got to apologize for whatever reason, my audio is not great today. Um, but I think I, I understood what you're doing. My, and I've probably told you this before. So tell me if I'm just giving you the same advice or if I'm not answering your question, you can ask it again, but my advice is always to do, do what you're doing, call them, ask them about the house, be helpful, always make sure you're honest. You know, if you have buyers in the area, you can mention that. If you don't, make sure you're telling them the truth. But um, as you get to know them, just try to, try to be helpful and offer helpful things to them as much as you can and follow up every day or every other day. Even if you feel like you're being a little bit annoying, if they want you to stop following up, they'll tell you, but things go so fast with for sale by owners, they could tell you there's no way I'm hiring an agent for at least a week. And then some realtor calls and says, Hey, I'll list it for free. Cause he's just so desperate to have a sign in the yard and gather leads or, Hey, I'll, I'll mow your lawn. If you let me list your house. I had a guy who was paying sellers to let them list his house, their houses, cause he was so desperate to get some momentum going so they could list it the next day. So it's important for you to communicate with them, 
every day if possible, if you want to implement a mailer so that you don't have to call every day, or maybe it's a text and then a phone call and then an email, then another phone call, a text, but you just have to be in front of them as much as possible, offering helpful information. And that can come in all sorts of different forms like, hey, I, there's this great article on how to for sale by owner that I found online. I thought it might be really helpful for you. Um, do you want me to email that over to you? Or, hey, here's some great tips on how to get more for your house. I know you guys are trying to sell it by owner and I just want to make sure you get the most possible. Um, here's, here's an article on how to present your home. And it says leave the lights on all the stuff that good seller tips are. Just be trying to do as much as possible. And then to always tell them that you, if they get an offer and they don't know what to do, you would love for them to call you and ask for advice and anything you're legally allowed to tell them without representing them, then you'd love to be a resource for them. So, Cause sometimes they'll get the offer and they'll be like, crap, we should have hired an agent cause I'm not a lawyer. And they might call you and sign a listing agreement with you after they got an offer. So you just have to stay in touch every single day. Does that make sense? Yes, that's great advice. And I suppose I, well, one of the things I thought of doing was also doing a CMA. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's, as you just learned, that's very valuable. And um, I, just like in the champions course, when I'm always recommending to you guys to tell your clients what you're doing, it's not bragging to say, hey, I, I did this CMA for you. Um, I wanted to let you know it did take me 45 minutes. So it's, it's a very valuable information. It's, it's, you know, much better than anything you'll, you'll just get free online or whatever, because I researched the condition of the homes, the neighborhoods, even down to the landscaping for you. So not asking to get paid, just wanted to let you know that I really did my research. So it's a valuable tool. And I did this for you guys, no strings attached. So don't just say, oh, here's a CMA, because they'll assume that you probably did what other agents did and it took you five minutes. Hey, Brian. Uh-huh. When do you doing this class again? I wasn't 100% up today, <laughs> you know, so. By the way, I just realized I put Paul Wynn's number in a private message to one of the agents instead of everybody. So I'm gonna, if you want a gift card, here's Paul's number. So when am I gonna do this class again, Jesse? Is that what you asked? Mm -hmm. huh. um, I don't know. I, I usually just do these in-between champions courses. So probably two or three months, but it's, okay. it's gonna be on the YouTube page on Friday. They upload it every Friday so you can rewatch it. Okay. Yeah. By the way, um, just to let you guys know, Chantel reads, writes, Dang it, I got it wrong. Is it right? <laughs> right. Right. You're good. Never going to figure it out. Chantelle R is on with us. <laughs> and she is um, a real estate coach. So I wanted her to come on to the Ask the Coach hour in case you guys want a better opinion than Brian's. Then she can chime in and answer questions as well. Chantelle does a lot with uh, mindset, motivation, daily planning anything you want to know and he's here for you as well. So what other questions do you guys have? Hi, I'm, my name's Nicole. I'm with Century Communities, the home builder. And um, what are your suggestions? Cause I, I do have to do CMAs for my office every couple times a month. And um, just kind of, tr I guess, what are your suggestions for, for new builds? and how to compare those. <laughs> I try to, only, and that's again, going into how, how much experience this takes. I try to only compare new builds to new builds. Um, maybe you could do, because sometimes a buyer will buy something and then move out of it because they get a job transfer or something. So maybe you can go back one or two years, but really it's, it's kind of like a brand new car. You're gonna, they should be selling for more than used homes. So if you compare it to even 10 year old homes, then they're gonna bring the values down. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's, it's all you, I didn't say anything. Keep going. Oh, I thought I heard somebody else. Um, 
So yeah, where I'm at, the area that I'm at, I don't have a lot of new builds to compare to. So it's just been a little more difficult. And so I'm kind of reaching out a little further distance and then trying to kind of see, you know, yeah, what's been built in at least, yeah, the last couple of years to compare to. So it's just. Yeah. And if you're doing that technique, just make sure you calculate the growth. So if you have to go back a year right now, you would add 10% to whatever you get because the market's gone up 10% in the last year or 15 or, you know, I always Google what the market has gone up in that area before I use old comparables. And then I add that to the final price. Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah. I have not been doing that. So thank you very much. Well, um, but I, I should have taken my buyers through your community before I told you guys to add 10% to your comparables. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, how do you is that, Jesse? Google the area? Do you just Google any area and just ask the question, uh, how much has the real estate market has gone up in this area or yeah. in a given address? Yeah, and cross-reference it with a few different, just do it by city or county even. Um, you know, Utah County price increases last year. You can Google all sorts of stuff, but I'd verify it through two or three reputable websites and just take the average. Okay. And Brian? Uh-huh. Uh, if you are like a CMA new house in the particular neighborhood and they have no houses sold, what to do on that condition? If you're looking for an old, if you're doing a market analysis on an old house, but there's lots of no, new, new, new house, new house, but in the, that subdivision, no house has been sold to compare with. Um, that's when you have to expand out. Like um, if I can't find any comparables at all, even within the one mile radius, sometimes I'll take an area that's similar, even if it's 30 miles away, if it's historically similar in values, Sometimes I'll try to do a CMA in that area with brand new homes, same size, everything, just to see what happens over there, because I know it's similar in price to where I'm at. Does that make sense? That's a, that's a risky, kind of a risky thing to do. I definitely would risky kind of a risky, getting an echo. I wouldn't show up to my clients and say, hey, here's the comparables from Tooele and we're in St. George. But I would, I sometimes use that just to get my head right. Like, okay. Homes over here were selling for an average of $200 per square foot this year. Homes over there were selling for $205 per square foot. So let me take this subject property and compare it to that area and see what it comes out at. Thanks, Brian. Uh -huh. That's kind okay. Of I have a quick question. Sorry, not about CMAs, but also hi, Chantel. I'm friends with Chantel. So, um, I, my question is, so I am out in Stansbury Park and there's a lot of like undeveloped land in like Erda and some of the surrounding areas. And I had a friend who wanted me to list um, a lot for him that he bought a little bit ago and decided he wanted to move to a different neighborhood. So I listed that for him. And now I have all these people that are asking me to find other lots for them. <laughs> and so I know this is like common everywhere, but um I don't know, like, cause they're not being listed on the MLS. So I know a couple of builders that um, are around that I've gone and talked to. Like one of the builders even was like, well, we don't have pricing. You just have to make sure they're qualified at, at least 700,000 and then just come and sit down with us and we'll try and get them like a price on something. So it's just like, I'm kind of having a hard time helping people. So, so you're hoping to find land outside of the building? <laughs> or with well uh, either way I'm just they don't mind going with builders but a lot of them are just like these small developers like the lot I'm actually listing right now uh -huh. where their families just owned a lot of land out here for a long time and so they became developers and they just go and like push they just develop a street and sell it but right. it's not like a big builder you know like Richmond or Symphony or any of those so right. I guess I'm just trying to find out like is my best bet just to kind of go around to like just calling all of them and trying to meet with them so I can get information because they're not advertising or anything like it's yeah. just I don't know. You, you have to do that and again that's part of us earning our paycheck um, and again I, I tell my clients that I'm doing it hey I'm, I'm going to go ahead and call these 15 builders <laughs> you know 
or I'm going to go and drive that area because some builders haven't even put it online. They just put their sign out like you would mm -hmm. think they would be in the industry long enough to know they'll get a higher price on the MLS, but I haven't figured that out yet. One cool thing you can do that will help you get business pretty much, you could probably build your career on this technique, honestly. If you use that um, satellite view that I told you about in the area they're interested in and look for stuff like this, you can look up the owner of that and send them a letter and it works a shockingly high percentage of the time. I don't know why I didn't do that instead of become a broker and just do that all day. But every time I've done it, we've, we've double-sided or um, not double-sided. I mean, we've, we've sold it and still had our buyers. Um, one of the times we did almost double-sided, it, but we don't encourage that. So I found another person to represent the builder or the owner of the land. But yeah, you know, you, you tell them, hey, I've got a buyer, we'll pay you 50,000 for, for that. They might think it's worth 20,000. They don't know, their grandpa left it to them. They haven't thought about it for 10 years. And all of a sudden you get your buyer a property for 50,000 under market value. You're like a superhero at that point. Or it doesn't work for your buyer and you tell the seller, well, if you're interested, I think I could get you even more on the open market. What if I could get you 80,000 for that? And he, they say, yeah, put the sign in tomorrow, let's go. Like you'll, you'll get all sorts of land listings and sometimes you'll find a really good deal for your buyer doing that. But you just use the tool, whatever area the people that are calling you are looking in, just try to find vacant pieces of land. Like we just found one right off the bat. bat. Here's, um, I think this is, maybe that's a flag lot, I don't know. But you get the idea, right? And then you click on the properties and you can find the mailing number by going to tax data because it's you're obviously not going to mail the letter to the vacant land. Please don't do that. <laughs> when you pull up tax data, find their actual mailing address. Just a random tip. Do you know like what would be like, obviously I am not familiar with the price of land lots because I don't really deal with that a lot what would be like a minimum that you would be comfortable telling somebody like I mean there's land so few and far between I'm sure that well you, you, a couple of methods we used will work for land the custom one will not work they don't have a tool for that or at least it, last time I tried it wasn't working um, but you can Almost every method we just went through, you could do for land um, to get an idea for it. I don't like ripping people off, even if they, because your job is to represent your client, right? So your fiduciary duty is to get the land for half of what it's worth for your client. But I usually encourage my client to do the right thing. <laughs> like I'll say, hey, it's worth like 250,000, this acre in American Fork, um, we could, offer him whatever you want, but do you want to be fair to him and see if he'll do 220, 230, or do you want to try to get it for 150? Okay. And most of my clients are good people. They'll be like, well, let's try to get a discount, but let's not rob him blind. Let's let's offer 210 or whatever. You know what I mean? Oh, that, that's not what I'm asking really. It's like, how do you know the price of the lot? Like to be fair, like to even start off asking, you know, sending the letter out because like, I don't know how you would get comparable because the land, you know, there's not a whole lot of land to compare it to. You know what I'm saying? Like, if, say, if I uh, found that um, empty lot in Kearns, how would I get, like, what that price would actually be? So I'm, I'm, I'm doing the method I really used. <clears throat> Sorry, we're getting a lot of feedback if somebody could mute themselves. I don't know where that's coming from. But I'm, I'm using the method we just barely used, but with land instead. Let's see if I can get that back. And it says no properties. So then I will redo it and go out three miles. There's one. To look how crazy this is. 
that one's 1 million, it's 1.44 acres. I'm sure that could be subdivided into an aplex or something. That's probably why it's so expensive. And this is a house I almost bought last year. That's funny. Neither of these are land. Great example, MLS, thank you so much. They probably list that as land because those are teardowns. But mm -hmm. that was a good example of you being correct, obviously, that it's sometimes hard to find. So honestly, what I do is I keep on expanding until I find something that at least better, even if it's five or 10 miles away. And then I, I just try to do my best to estimate how much the price difference would be. Like if it's in Tooele and then something comes up in Magna, um, in the past, maybe not now, but in the past, I would say that Magna is going to be more valuable than Tooele because it's not as far out there. Oh, there were a lot there. Dang it, I should have left that. But um, you, it takes a lot more discernment than a normal CMA. There's not an easy answer for that. One short, short um, shortcut I would use is try to find builders and see what their base price is for their lots. And maybe you could use that as a little bit of a guide. So say you're looking at these and they're not helping you out because they're all over the map. And then, but there's an edge community right here. I would call edge and say, what is the value of the lots? I know you're selling houses with the lot, but what is the value of the mm -hmm. lot? Because they know what the lot premium is and all that. And if they tell you, well, the quarter acres we'll, we're selling for um, the lot is 119 with a $5,000 premium. Okay, so 125, 124 is what edge is selling them for. And then you're looking at some of these other ones that are active on the market, but not sold, then, you know, you can find something in between because usually they're getting it for really cheap because they're developing a huge area. But if your client can get it for the same cost that like a builder is actually claiming they're charging for the land, then you're probably getting them a pretty good deal. But these ones are probably going to be higher, the actives on the market. And obviously being smart, like we talked about, you'd want to compare it more to backups and solds than you would to actives anyway. Now that gave us all kinds of options when we switched it to backup and sold. Here's one right next to the subject property and it sold in February. It was only on the market for 11 days and it sold for 15,000 higher than it was listed for. So in this area, there's plenty, but that's not always going to be the case. I mean, we got what 58 comparables within that six miles. If you take it down to two miles, let's see how many we had. We've only got five within two miles. So sometimes when you're lucky, you'll you'll get some like this one. It looks like we have a good variety. Like these four would probably give us an idea of how much we would want to list it for. Um, this one's obviously a totally different thing. But if you can't find anything, you just have to keep expanding out, look into the builders. And if you still can't find anything, um, if you're representing the buyer, you just offer as low as you think you can without insulting them. If you're representing the seller, then you'll probably want to try to, I don't want to encourage you to overprice it, but just do your best. It's, I don't know what I would do at that point if I couldn't find anything even within 10 miles. I might use that method I just told Jesse to use where I might grab a comparable from a similar um, type of town, like if it was just way out in the outskirts, maybe in price, I might grab something from Nephi, you know, and say, okay, Nephi's prices are similar to price. They're not, but just for the sake of an example, then maybe compare it to what land's selling for in that other city. Awesome, this has been very helpful. Thank you so much. Welcome. That last answer, I don't know. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> Here's some ideas, but you don't always know. <clears throat>
But I guarantee if all of you send 100 letters to vacant lots, one, some of them will get 10 letters. So it might not be the best thing, but I guarantee one of you would come back with a listing or two next week. So I would highly recommend if you have a buyer wanting to build and they're willing to custom build on a vacant lot, start sending out letters to vacant lot owners. Good questions. So we got 12 more minutes. Remember, um, question can be about anything. It can be about motivation, time management. If you're struggling with a difficult buyer or seller, can't find a house for somebody, can't get an offer accepted, whatever's going on. Just don't ask me relationship advice. <laughs> I have a relationship question. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, are there no more townhomes under 320 that you know? Um, not that I know of. I'm sure there are, but not in Utah or Salt Lake County. I guess Salt Lake has some every now and then, but they're very small and they're kind of, you know, they're in deep city areas that aren't as you know, appealing for somebody who wants to be out in open air and have more of a rural feel. Um, okay. But new builds is impossible, right? To get anything under 330, 340. I haven't yeah. seen it. I haven't seen it. I do have the inside scoop on a couple of builders that are working on some modern projects that I'm really excited about. Um, should start getting us in the low twos again for some condos and townhomes, but a couple years out. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're gonna Thank be you. they're gonna be kind of tiny house-ish, but it's more about um, the way they're built than the size. So they might still be okay sized, but I'm pretty excited about it. It'll help keep some of my friends in the state. <laughs> tiny houses, that's a cool concept. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Uh-huh. So when people don't have questions, Chantel, I'll usually just share something cool I learned recently or some words of advice. Do you have a do you have anything that you want to share with everybody to help them in their real estate journey this week? Sure. Um, so I was listening this morning to um, John Maxwell on Mondays does a Monday morning Facebook live thing that I was listening to. One of the things that he said actually really stood out to me. Um, when we're doing really anything, but it's make yourself unforgettable. And how do we do that when we're stepping into different roles or when we're trying to meet with clients or whatever that is, um, when we're getting in front of people, you know, he's, it doesn't have to be this big ostentatious thing that we, that we do um, to make ourselves memorable to people, but it's, it was about just adding value. And he used the example of him trying to get um, in front of a, a, coach or someone that he really respected when he first started out. And he said it took him about a year or a year and a half where he just had little moments where he was in front of this particular coach and just added value in 30 seconds when he was there. And he said, after about a year and a half, his friend that worked for this coach said you, they were going to Seoul, Korea. And he said, Hey, let's figure out how to get John Maxwell on this trip to, to Korea with us. Right. And so it was just these little things of just constantly getting in there and adding value to the people that you're around and the people that you want to work with. And it doesn't have to be something big, but make yourself unforgettable. So that's my little two cents for you today. I really like that. Um, I, I hate these little breaks from champions training because champions training is about cool stuff like that. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up because I was listening to a book about recruiting the other day. So totally different genre, right? But it was, it was just the same thing. Like when, whenever you're trying to convince anybody to do anything, just add as much value as possible. Even if it doesn't sell you, it has nothing to do with what you're asking them to do. It just creates this endearment and they look at you as an ally and an advocate and somebody who's on their side. And then when it comes time for them to make a decision about you, whether it's inviting you on a cruise or listing your house or whatever it may be, then they, they trust you you know, because you trust people that help you. So always add value no matter 
if there looks like there's a, word, a reward or not. Great advice, Chantel. Thank you. That's why you're an awesome coach. <laughs> so we got seven more minutes. I imagine that's time for at least one more question. The biggest obstacle is people worry that nobody wants to hear their question or maybe it's too private. If it's private enough that you don't want 500 people watching it on recording, but you're okay with the 10 of us seeing it, I'm happy to end the recording now. Um, but if you, you know, these last seven minutes, nobody's spoken up. So whatever you need help with, the time is yours. Okay, and I think, I think maybe um, some people already know this, but I just wanna make sure that, that uh, I have never dropped a CMA to uh, uh, to any neighbors or anybody, just you know, like a complimentary thing. That CMA that uh, you did was it a costume where you have all of the different checks and what you're gonna print? It's a costume, right? Yeah. That's that's the packet that you would drop off at somebody's house, right? That's the one. Yeah, just because it would be more accurate and I wouldn't want to build unrealistic expectations. Having uh -huh. said that, if you're trying to do a lot, like if you want to drop off 20 CMAs this week and just introduce yourself, you mm -hmm. could easily um, you could easily do the cloud CMA and then just don't drop it off. Make sure you hand it off so you can say, hey, I'm, I, these are pretty quick to do. So I did them for all the neighbors, just as a favor. I don't want, I, I love using this line. I definitely will be mad at you if you use this information and sell your house, cause I want you to stay. But you know, if you're wondering what your home is worth or if you wanna get out an equity loan or whatever, it's just nice to know what your house is worth. I just gotta warn you, this was a quick one. So it gives a huge range, but you can kind of see the comparables. Here's how to read this. And I teach them how to look at it. So they're, they're not lost. But then I followed up with, if you want a more detailed one, I actually can do those and they don't take me a lot of time. So just let me know and I can get you a more detailed value. And that's when you list houses is when they're like, yeah, I'd love a more detailed value because we've actually been thinking of moving. So it's, it's almost a good thing to take them and not as great one because you can do for a second appointment. So you actually talk to them, right? You, you go, do you say, hey, I'm coming over? Or did you just go knock at the door? Hopefully they're there or? Just depends on the relationship. If I have their number, I'd say, hey, I, I, I got you guys a little something um, or I got you an unusual gift is a line that I've used before. Um, when can I drop it off? But if you don't know them and you've never met them or you don't know them and they'd be, if you get their number from something different, like some sort of list that you probably shouldn't be using, then maybe they'd be creeped out if you call them. So that's when I'd just knock, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. I'm okay. sure I'm sure nobody knows what list I'm talking about, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea, so I, I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, all right, thank you. Um... Looks like I got a question, let me see. I have a buyer that we have wrote around 15 offers and haven't got any of those accepted. He is only qualified for an FHA loan. We have been waiving everything, way over asking, non-refundable earnest money and a three week close. Any other ideas of how we might get an offer accepted? Thanks. <clears throat> what list are you talking about? I'll end the recording before I talk about that list. No. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, the and actually videos uploading to YouTube usually won't have the Ask the Coach Hour, but today's been valuable, so we'll leave it all on there. So the first question there with the 15 offers, first of all, I would make sure you're doing the right thing when preparing the offers. I always call the agent and I do several things. I will call him and one, ask him, obviously, how many offers do you have? What's the interest level? All that stuff. And then I'll ask, is there any flexibility? What's the seller situation? Questions they shouldn't answer, but sometimes do. And then I will ask them, um, what does your seller want to see that's unique? And they'll say, what do you mean? And I'll say, okay, well, you're probably gonna get two, three, five, ten 10 offers, however many it's gonna be. 
what could I do that would uniquely help your seller um, that would stand out? And my most recent time doing this, they actually accepted our offer, more or less verbally accepted it immediately before everybody else had even gone and seen the home. And they were anticipating like 20, 30 offers on this. But he's like, you know, that's so cool that you asked. And she does have this unique situation. And he went into how she lived with her brother and her brother had just died and she was in a horrible place. She just wanted to be done with the house. But anyway, long story short, if we could get it closed super fast, but let her stay for specifically two weeks, that would totally solve her dilemma. And we're like, cool, write it up, done. We didn't have to go above purchase price. None of our earnest money was non-refundable. And we, we just asked the questions and catered the offer to them. Another time we went really deep. We're like, so we saw that there were a lot of pictures of Western stuff in your client's home. Is that like, does he love Western stuff? And he's like, oh yeah, his grandpa owned this museum and blah, 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 blah. So in the offer, we literally wrote that we as agents would buy him a $500 Western painting of his choice. And he just thought that was so cool. Like, wow, they're paying attention. So get as creative as possible, ask as many questions as possible. And outside of that, I mean, right now you just have to keep on offering. I have a few other tips that we could go over, maybe text me and we can set up a call because we've tried all sorts of different crazy things. So I could go on and on for probably five or 10 minutes, but really quick before we hit 12 o'clock, I'm gonna answer Rob's question. Um, well, actually, yeah, just text me, Lisa, if you wanna set that up. And I am going to, see. 